Welcome everyone from APHRS 2025 here in Yokohama. I am Alessandra Pina for Heart Rhythm TV and today I'm here with Dr. Rahul Doshi, electrophysiologist from the Cardiac Arrhythmia Group, Arizona State University. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Today we are going to talk about one of the late breaking clinical trials that was presented yesterday. This um, evaluated the outcomes of dual chamber leadless pacemakers in patients under 65 years old. And this data come from the AVERTR IDE trial. So Dr. Dashi, do you want to summarize for us the results of the study? Absolutely, and without getting into any of the real details or numbers, um, I think quite simply, yeah. This was certainly, as you stated, is from the AVER DRID trial. So it was a cohort of about 450 patients and just simply segregated by age, right? So 65 was the cutoff, less than 65, greater than or equal to 65 years of age. And then quite simply, um, in a population that is younger than 65, with, of course, an indication for pacing, and by the way, um, a higher degree of comorbidities, um, that was actually an interesting difference in the two groups. The uh, younger patients actually had a higher uh, incidence of comorbidities. Um, actually, the implants were not just successful and safe. Um, they were in some ways better, right? The atrial implant was faster. This translated to a faster overall procedure. Implant characteristics were essentially the same in terms of electrical parameters. They were all excellent. Safety parameters were excellent. Um, and very importantly in this patient population, the AV synchrony was excellent. Um, both groups were excellent, but literally it was 100% in the younger patient population, which is, of course, is, I think, incredibly important. If we're thinking about population of patients who need to maintain AV synchrony, at higher heart rates, lower heart rates, increased activity, different postures, more active, right? Um, and so essentially, those were the results. Yeah, I think this is amazing because we're shifting the perspective. So we go from a single chamber leadless device that, does, that doesn't give any AV synchrony and is mainly implanted in older, frail patients. And now we have a dual chamber device that provides great AV synchrony and great acute success rates and low complications rates. So can we like shift the perspective and start implanting these devices in younger populations, you think, and healthier populations maybe? I think it depends. So the short answer I think is yes. I think it depends on the indication. Uh, and then it gets a little interesting, right? So for example, there's already been actually a fair amount of data looking at ventricular leadless pacing in patients with profound cardio inhibitory syncope, yes. right? You have a leadless pacemaker, it'll last 20 plus years, very rare need for pacing, low pacing burden, an excellent alternative where you don't have to think about long-term lead complications in a very young population. I think this actually pushes it a little bit further, right? So instead of very young patients, we are now talking about you know, middle-aged patients, certainly less than the age of 65, but with sinus node dysfunction, you could implant a device that you know actually can provide the benefits that we're used to in traditional dual-chamber transvenous pacemakers, yet not have to worry about the long-term lead implications where leads break, infection uh, complications related to device implantation, certainly with generator changes or uh, revisions or upgrades and the like, uh, and so I think this does actually expand that or changes the way we think about, oh, I want to hold off in this particular age in implanting, right, as much as possible versus my threshold might be much less in an elderly patient or a frail patient, as you Absolutely. suggest. And not only like we can also implant the atrial pacemaker in a silent node disease and then possibly upgrade later to a dual chamber I, device. I think that is an incredibly important aspect. Um, and, you know, so I'm going to exercise the fact that I'm significantly older than you, right? <laughs> so, you know, going back to traditional pacing, right? We started with ventricular transvenous. And then we have to demonstrate that atrial base pacing is better. And, but that came with dual chamber transvenous, right? The most trial. 
Uh, and the big trial, transvenous, was a Dan Pace trial, which looked at atrial transvenous versus dual chamber. And there were essentially no difference in outcomes, except, except of course, the need to upgrade in a small group of patients, about 9% or something like that. And in fact, with, despite that number being small, the recommendations, because you are upgrading a transvenous device, a surgical procedure, transvenous leads, risk of infection, risk of pocket complications, risk of thoracic trauma, we have evolved to only implanting dual chamber transvenous. Yes. But that doesn't apply to leadless, right? You can have an atrial only device and in that small patient population, you can easily upgrade, but you don't have to worry about thoracic trauma. You don't have to worry about the risk of infection, whether it's pocket or systemic, or you or pocket pain, or whatever the complications that you think of that are tr associated with traditional transvenous implantation. So I think that's a, a very important point, and I think this is going to shift the paradigm of how we approach these patients. Why not give patients only what they need initially? Yeah, Not absolutely. to mention, the, the obviously, the uh, effects on battery longevity yes. are tremendous. Because that's, I think, another important aspect. Like, maybe the only data that we don't have are longevity, and maybe some removal data, like how long can we wait before we can remove the pacemaker? We have something. We, we have good data on the ventricular pacemaker, maybe not enough on the atrial pacemaker, but the active fixation, I think, is made to be removable. So I, do you I, have thoughts about this? I completely agree. I, as, as you stated, the ventricular retrieval data has been excellent. Atrial, we're limited, right? We don't have long-term data. Uh, but James Zip actually presented at our annual scientific sessions uh, uh, in San Diego that in a group of 10 patients with around two years longevity, they could be easily retrieved. So this is the first step. But the device is, as you say, is designed to be retrieved. Yes. And so, absolutely. All right. I think we'll close here. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Darshi, for joining us at Heart Rhythm TV for these beautiful insights. I think we're all eager to see what brings us to the future, okay? My pleasure, thank you. Thank you.